Well, good morning, afternoon, evening, whenever you may be watching this, everyone. My name is Evan Alexander. I'm the youth pastor at Tom's Creek, and here we are today in Sunday School again. I'm filling in for Tyler, and I'm thankful for the opportunities to get to teach God's Word. And today we're going to be looking at something I've entitled Gray Areas. Essentially, it's how do we discern sin and not sin, right from wrong, when the Bible's not so clear on whether it is or not. Um, how do we formulate a step-by-step -step process of figuring out whether things are sin or not when it comes to how do we live our lives? Uh, just for example of some of the areas that kind of people question, which you've probably questioned some in your own life, or you at least have had others ask you ask these questions. I've had some that have asked me questions about cussing, uh, what are the language we use. Um, of course, the Bible uh, in James it says to control our tongue and Colossians, we see that no ungodly talk should come out of our mouths, but who decides which words are right, which words are wrong? At what extent is it cussing? At what extent is it just um, other words that we use? There are some words that don't mean the same thing that's meant years ago, and some, as language changes and, and words and definitions change, who decides what is cussing, what is wrong, what is ungodly speech, and what is not? The Bible doesn't have a list of words, and so how do we discern right from wrong according to that? Others will ask questions uh, concerning things such as drinking. The Bible is very clear, absolutely undeniably clear, that drunkenness is wrong. But it's a little bit of a gray area for, for many who interpret Scripture on whether drinking is okay, whether it's a social drinking or just casual drinking or drinking for health benefits. So, so there's kind of these little areas in Scripture where it doesn't quite seem to be white and black. It's a little bit of gray in the middle. So how do we as Christians who are called to live holy, pure lives, Christ-like lives, how do we discern right from wrong when the Bible doesn't seem to be very clear on it? I've kind of I've put together some questions that I think are very helpful in helping us decide this because whereas the Bible may not give exact specifications on what we should do and what we shouldn't do in every aspect of how we should live, the Bible absolutely gives us uh, more than enough and is sufficient in helping us discern right from wrong according to God's Word. So often when people ask uh, ask me or ask others, well, well, do you think this is wrong or not? Or should I do this or not? So often they're expecting or hoping that we'll just say, yes, absolutely, just go ahead. Just pat them on the shoulder, pat them on the head and say, you're good to go, do what you want to do. But um, so, we, and then that way, if they disagree with us or tell us, no, that's wrong, that's sin, then we can say that they're the bigot. They're the one that doesn't know what's going on. They're the one that have, um, the wrong idea and we are still in the right. So, so often we put others on trial when it comes to whether sin is, um, whether something is sin or not in our own lives. But I would argue a little bit of a shift in that instead of putting others on trial about whether our actions or thoughts or ways of life are sinful, we need to put ourselves on trial. Because here's the thing, each of us will live our lives and we will at one day die. The Bible says that it is appointed for every man to die once and after that the judgment. So every one of us will live and in Romans we see that we'll stand before God and give an account for our lives. And so there is coming a day when each of us, our lives will be on trial. And so I would say better to do it now and to really have a biblical perspective on sin now as opposed to standing before the judgment throne of God. And so how do we discern these things that are right and wrong? I kind of want to start us in our diving board of our, our thought here in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 5, this is what the author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 5 verse 13 and 14. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with a message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. So essentially what the author of Hebrews is saying is that being able to discern good from evil, sin from not sin, righteous from unrighteous, unethical from ethical, being able to discern those things is a sign of Christian maturity. And as each of us have been called to grow in our faith, to grow in our relationship with Christ, to grow in our maturity and when it comes to being a Christian, I think this is a place we can all use some work on, some place where we could obviously use some help. So let's put our lives to the test today. Uh, if you are if you are sitting or standing or whatever you may be doing right now, if you, if, if you are listening and there is an area of your life where you're undetermined yet of figuring out whether this is sin or not, whether I should do this or not according to God's will, I put together four questions that I think are very helpful for whatever the situation may be to really discern from a biblical worldview and perspective on whether it is right or wrong in the eyes of God. So let's start with question number one. The first question is by far the most important. It is, does the Bible clearly say that this is wrong? I wanted to start here because as we're looking at certain gray areas, I don't want to 
misspeak and say that the Bible is not clear on some things. The Bible is absolutely abundantly clear on many issues. We have things such as the Ten Commandments and the law, and then we have some of the New Testament um, parallels of many functions of the law and the writings of Paul and the teachings of Jesus that show us that, yes, there are some things that are wrong in the Old Testament that are still wrong today. Uh, then we also see that... Um, so as we, as we look at our own lives, there are some things that the Bible's very abundantly clear on. Things uh, such as adultery, murder, lying, cheating, pride, gluttony, homosexuality. Uh, there are some things that the, the Bible's just abundantly clear on, and it's not really up for debate. Uh, unless, unless you're just going to say that the Bible is not the authority. Unless you just absolutely disqualify and push aside God's word, uh, there's no argument that can be made for it being right. Essentially, if if you're a married person today and you're wondering, well, should I cheat on my wife or not or should I have a relationship with someone else? Um, there is no justification here. The Bible says it's wrong. And so there's no, uh, well, she doesn't love me anymore or she uh, he doesn't uh, treat me like he should. There's no justification, no argument, no reasoning that makes it okay. So does the Bible clearly say this is wrong? There's there's just some things the Bible is very clue on. Now, if your qu answer to that question is, does the Bible say this is wrong? If your answer to that is, I don't know, then that's only a good enough answer until you actually do the study. And I think ignorance is is no excuse when it comes to it. Imagine if I were to be driving down the road speeding and all of a sudden the blue lights come on behind me and uh, I pull over and uh, the Georgia State Patrol or someone comes to the window and says, hey, do you know you're speeding? Uh, I don't know is not a sufficient answer there. Uh, it, it As a responsible driver, I need to be looking at the signs. I need to know the laws. If I were to say, I don't know, I would maybe get a warning, probably not. And so I'm still going to be in the wrong there. There's no justification there. Uh, there's no getting out of that just by saying, I don't know. So there's a point where just being ignorant is no excuse anymore. Ignorance of scripture, especially when it comes to this, is no excuse. Can you imagine standing before the throne of God and God saying, why did you do that? And for you to say, I don't know. I didn't know it was wrong. And then God <laughs> shows you from his own scripture, from the many uh, sermons and Bible studies and other things he tried to show you. And you just said, no, I didn't pay attention. Ignorance of scripture is no excuse. Look at what the Bible itself says about scripture. Psalm 119.9. Here's a few verses. Psalm 119.9. It says, how can a man keep his way pure? That's a great question. How can a man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word, by obeying the scripture. Psalm 119, 11, another great verse. Thy word I have hidden my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. That I might not sin against God. I hide God's word in my heart so that I don't sin against him. The word of God plays a big role there. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 and 12. Paul writes, Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written about for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the age have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stand take heed, lest he does not fall. Take heed of what? The examples from the idiots of the Old Testament and New Testament who lived their lives their own way, and it was recorded down for our instruction. Uh, the stories in Scripture, this so often we, we read the Bible and uh, we think, Oh, it's um, David, you dummy. Stop it. No. No, Abraham, don't say it's your sister. It's your wife. Don't lie about this. There's times we read through scripture and we're like, ah, how can you do that? It's obviously against God's will. And we're wondering, how do these patriarchs of, uh, of our religion, how do they mess up so bigly? And why in the world does it record it? It's recorded so we don't slip up in the same way as they do. So we don't do the same things they do. So we don't live the same way. So we live differently. So we learn from others' mistakes. I am the youngest of four. I have three older sisters. And I, I think I got maybe two spankings as a kid. Uh, and the reason why, though, is because I learned a lot from my sisters who made some other mistakes. There's sometimes I just saw them make mistakes. And I'm like, that's not worth it. Not doing it. So Paul says, this, these things were written for our instruction. So take heed lest you fall, fail, or sin. Romans 15, 4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Again, same kind of concept. Uh, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Hope how? Hope because we already have seen the examples of others and we know some of the same pitfalls and, and uh, I guess, shortcomings and um, ways that we can mess up. We learn from their mistakes. Psalm 
119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. God's word just shines the path before us, showing us God's will and discernment in his ways. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, for the word of God is living, it is active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spear of both joints and marrow, and what? Able to judge the thoughts and intentions of man. The word of God not doesn't just judge what we do, it judges our intentions, it in, it um, discerns our own thoughts so that whereas we may do the right thing, it's for the wrong reasons and it's still wrong. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be what? Adequate, equipped for every good work. Uh, so when it comes to the word of God, ignorance is no excuse. There is so much fruit, so much to glean and understand from scripture to where if we're going to assess our lives and put our lives on trial, if we're going to ask, does the Bible clearly say this is, this is sin? We need to know what the Bible says. Ignorance of scripture is absolutely no excuse, but we also have to be careful not to abuse or misuse scripture. Um, by this, I mean to avoid using scripture to support ideas or actions that it does not actually support. People misuse, misquote, and abuse scripture all the time. There's a wonderful illustration by um, a pastor, Fred Craddock, who passed away a few years ago. He was a pastor in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Georgia. Uh, he wrote some great books and preached some great sermons. He, in one of his sermons, he has a bunch of examples of, of misuse of scripture, uh, one of those being... Um, being holding up a sign at the Braves game uh, where it's, it's one of the passages from the, the Gospels that says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Uh, just, just some are humorous, some are more, more accurate descriptions of um, being mad at people. Well, the Bible says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, so I can do this to them. I had a friend who once misused the golden rule, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He misquoted it as do unto others as they have done unto you using his their mistreatment of him as an excuse or biblical justification of mistreating others. And so in all of that, there's ways that we can misuse and abuse Scripture. Uh, think about it this way. Um, if two athletic teams go into a competition and both of them are led by Christian coaches and have some strong spiritual leaders in their group, both of them are praying. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jeremiah 29.11, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you and for success. And, and both teams are going in praying these scriptures for the game, hoping for a win. And then one of them's got to lose. So in that, we can misuse and abuse scripture so much so when it comes to this idea of does the bible clearly say this is wrong uh, we have to be careful one not to remain ignorant but secondly not to abuse scripture to the point of making it say what we want it to say so question one of putting ourselves on trial is does the bible clearly say this is wrong if it clearly says it's wrong it's wrong period end of discussion no more asking questions of others no more putting others on trial no more discernment or prayer or other things it's it's repent stop doing it and move on if the bible says it's wrong stop that's it no discussion don't go past question one the other three questions are not for you if the bible says it's wrong end of discussion but what if the bible's not so clear what if what if there's a little bit of debate that could be had there then how do we discern the gray areas? And that is where we're going to spend the last little bit here. Because whereas there's not a passage in Scripture that clearly says, do this, do this, do this, do this, the Bible does give us some clear standards by which we can assess the will of God. So question number two, and I think this is a very good place to move on, is does this glorify God? The Bible may not be clear on everything, but the Bible is very clear on that we should do all things for the glory of God. Look at some of the passages in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do what? Do all for the glory of God. Not enough. Colossians 3, 17. Paul says again, And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 1 Corinthians again, 6.20, for you've been bought with a price. Therefore, what? Glorify God in your body. Everything we do should bring honor and glory to God. So there's more we can look at, but I think we can agree that Scripture is absolutely clear on this. We are called to live our lives in such a way that God is glorified in all that we do. So we have to ask ourselves, when it comes to this action, when it comes to this idea, when it comes to this way of life, when it comes to this part of my life, does it bring glory to God? 
Does it bring glory and honor to God? The, to glorify means to exalt, to elevate, to make great. So ask, do, is God made great through this that I'm doing? Do my beliefs, my way of life, do they bring honor and glory to God? And specifically also in the lives of those around you. So we're going to look at two different subsets here. Does this bring glory to God in my life? With this in mind, we are able to look at the intentions and results of what we do. For instance, let's pick something we can all agree upon that is good. Say there's a neighbor you have that maybe lost their job or isn't able to put food on their table. Um, They work hard. They uh, are trying to make ends meet, but they're just struggling right now. I think all of us would agree that charity is, is a good thing there. That charity is a good thing there. That It is a good thing for us to um, maybe give a little extra money there, go buy groceries for them, offer to cook for them. There's so many ways that we can meet that need. I think none of us would just sit there and say, that's an evil thing to do, don't do that. No, if we see a brother uh, hungry, we give them food. That's good, but but change it on, on, on its head here. What if instead of doing it just to be nice or to bring honor and glory to God, what if we do it so that we can take a picture with them and then uh, put it on social media and say, look at how awesome I am. What if we already have someone on the line that's going to write a whole op-ed in the newspaper about how awesome and great and generous you are? Then all of a sudden, instead of God receiving the glory, who's receiving the glory there? You are, or I am. So if that's the case, yes, it may be a good thing to do, but is it bringing honor and glory to God? No. The Bible says that in Romans um, 14, 23, that he that eats is damned if he eats, for he eats not of faith, and anything that is not of faith is sin. Meaning this, we can do good things in our lives, that is still sin because it's far from God. That may be a little bit of a hefty thing to think through, but I think that that at least helps us in understanding good people go to hell. People, the what is the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So when, when it comes to our lives, like, yes, we can do good things, but if they're not for God, they're still sin. So if I'm commanded and expected to do all things for the glory of God, and here I am doing all things for heaven, then there's something wrong in my heart and I, I need to repent. Secondly, though, is, is not only is God being honored and glorified in my life, is God being honored and gloried in the lives of others? Another consideration is whether or not God is being glorified in the lives of those around me. Let's, let's, uh, let me paint a picture for you. A beautiful picture of Scripture here. God creates mankind to worship Him. He created all men and women in His image with dignity, worth, and value. But then mankind does the unthinkable. And instead of worshiping God, they began to worship themselves. They began to act for themselves and sin entered the world and God being both loving and just and desiring to make, uh, to bring mankind back to him. He did all things that were necessary for mankind to be right with him. He did all things necessary by sending his own son to pay the debt for, uh, to pay the debt for our sins with his own blood. So we may rightly worship God again. God did all that. It's a beautiful picture of scripture. We see that God has made a way for salvation for you, for me, and for all those around us. But, but here's the thing. God is not worshiped in most places. There are many places where God is not worshiped. In fact, even in the U S 82% of the Northeast is lost. Uh, The North American mission board did a study and 82%, 82% of the Northeast is lost. 87% of the West, our neighbors to the North and Canada is estimated that 90% do not have a relationship with God. There's a billion people in India that will live and die and spend an eternity in a place called hell. So is what I'm doing, not just considering is God being glorified in my life, but am I living in such a way to where God is being glorified in the lives of others? If what I am doing is bringing a stumbling block before others, then it is sin, which brings us to question three, and that's exactly it, is does this that I'm doing, that I'm thinking the way of life, does this provide a stumbling block before others? I have to consider how others perceive my actions and how my actions are interpreted by those around me. If you find yourself able to answer yes to the previous question concerning your relationship with God, think of how your actions may affect others. Can your decision influence others to make a poor decision? By continuing, may you possibly set a precedent or a bad example that may damage others. May your testimony be damaged due to others' perception of you. If, you, if a lost person were to look at your decision in your life, would it help or harm their journey to knowing God personally? Another clear command from Scripture. We, we see that we are to glorify God with our lives, but the Bible also says that we are not to put stumbling blocks before others. Look at this, Romans 14, 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. It's a great verse. Can't judge me. Don't judge each other. But what does he say after that? But rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in the brother's way. 1 Corinthians 8, 9. But take heed, lest by any means of liberty of yours you become a stumbling block to them who are weak. Now, there's an old country song by Rodney Atkins uh, that's called Watching You. This is a great example of this. There's so much 
theology we can get from country songs, really any any genre of music. But this particular song, I've used it as an illustration before, but these are the lyrics of part of that song. A green traffic light turned straight to red. I hit my brakes and mumbled under my breath. His fries went a-flying and his orange drink covered his lap. Well, then my four-year-old said a four-letter word that started with S and I was concerned. So I said, son, where did you learn to talk like that? And then we come to the chorus. He says, I've been watching you, dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo and a be like you and eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We got cowboy boots and camo pants. Yeah, we're just alike. Hey, ain't we, dad? I want to do everything you do. So I've been watching you. Now this father, where did this son learn the four-letter word that started with an S? He learned it from his father. His father was upset that his son had, had said that word, but who did he learn it from? As, as parents, there's a clear command and danger for us that others are watching us, but on, on, in a much fuller way, there are people always watching us, whether you're a parent or not. And so in this, we are called to live our lives in such a way where others will look at us and not have stumbling blocks set before them. Think about this. Maybe that, uh, maybe that father, maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't consider that four-letter word a bad word, but uh, well, he obviously did because he was ups upset when his son said it. But in this, there was uh, so many parallels when it comes to life. Maybe, maybe you as a parent, you don't believe that drinking is wrong. Maybe you believe a drink is okay. But what if your son becomes an alcoholic? What if they view your your example and then all of a sudden they lead down a life to where live a life that is absolutely sinful? Maybe you uh, just pass out drunk. But what if what if someone else influenced by your decisions? Uh, gets angry and beats their wife. Uh, that's, a, that's a harsh place to go, but it's a place we got to go. We have to consider how our actions and our decisions and how we view sin affects others. There's so many ways to look at this, but I think Jesus' words to Peter are helpful. Peter disagrees with Jesus about what's going to happen uh, to him. And listen to what Jesus says, Matthew 16, 23. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man. Uh, pastor used this illustration many years ago, but uh, it's essentially uh, he used to drink root beer. He still drinks root beer. I was with him on a trip. Not well, It's been a while now, but I accidentally grabbed his cup instead of mine. I drank out of it. It was root beer. It's the one of the most disgusting drinks in the world, but he used to love drinking root beer all the time. Uh, he would uh, be cutting grass in his front yard, and he'd have the brown little bottle that had root beer on it, but he said he became convicted about that because others would drive by, and he started thinking, what if others are looking at me and interpret what I'm doing wrongly? So he, he, as a pastor, he made the decision to not drink root beer anymore while uh, cutting grass at least, or at least while others could see him, just because uh, others may look at him and get the wrong idea about what he's doing or how, how he is acting and might take it the wrong way or might also might use it as a justification of, of um, drinking their, in their own life. He believed without a shadow of a doubt that it was not wrong for him to drink root beer. But he did believe that if it provided a stumbling block before others, it would be. So the issue was with setting a precedent that may possibly help others to stumble in their faith. And so he quit. You see, we're the ones that will stand before God and give an account for our lives. But our lives do affect others. How we live our life does affect others. So when we place ourselves on trial, when we place our actions and our thoughts and our deeds, we have to answer these questions. Does the Bible clearly say it's wrong? If so, in a discussion. But if not, and it's a little bit of a gray area, start thinking through this. Does what I'm doing bring honor and glory to God or not? Uh, if yes, we can move on to the next question. But if not, stop doing it. If, it. if it's bringing honor and glory to yourself, to anyone else, or if it is perhaps dishonoring the name of God, the name above all names, the name by which we are saved, then it's sin. we got to stop. The third question. Does it provide a stumbling block before others? Maybe it's right in our eyes. Maybe we think it's right in God's eyes, but if it is going to lead someone else to a place called hell, then it is something worth considering here. So ask yourselves these questions. Are you fighting against the scripture, God's clear commands and expectations for our lives? Does your life bring absolute glory to God? Are you leading others in your life farther from God or are you leading them to him? There are, these are questions we have to ask ourselves, but I have one final question that I think just kind of sums up the end here. And that question is, is it even worth it? Maybe, maybe it's sin, maybe it's not. Uh, you know, maybe you're fully convinced, yes, it was honoring to God. It's not a big deal. And no one else is going to see me. It's in the privacy of my own house. No one else is going to see this. But at the end of the day, is it even worth it? Is it even worth it? Is it worth risking my family over? Is it worth risking my career over? Is it worth risking my testimony? Is this where I need to plant my boots firm and fight? Or will I be okay with giving this part of my life up? 
Will I be okay by, by stopping this? I have only one life to live, and there are so many lost people around us to where if I'm going to live and die and stand before God, um, as everyone will, if I'm going to live, die, and stand before God, am, am I okay with how I live my life? I think in so many different ways. You have to ask, is it even worth the risk? There are other questions we can ask, but I think this is a good start. The Bible may not answer exactly every question we may have in life, but it absolutely provides us a solid framework by which we can discern God's will and how we should live. Uh, when it comes to our lives, this is the one life we have. We don't really have room for just saying it's not that big of a deal. You see, if we're going to stand before the throne of God one day, we got to be sure that we're living our lives in the way we should. Um, so often there's, uh, I don't know, there's an evangelism tactic of, of essentially saying that um, it's better to believe in God and die and not and it not be real than it is to not believe in God and die and then all of a sudden realize you're wrong. You see, if I believe in God and I live my life and I die and, and that's it, if that's just it, there's no God, no eternal life, no anything, then I really don't lose anything. Worst case scenario, I miss out on a few fun moments, but if my life just ends like that, then I'll never know I was wrong. I'll never know it was a waste of moment, so it really is not that big of a deal. But, but here's the other thing. If I live my life my own way, I'm thinking God doesn't exist, God doesn't matter. If I live in such a way and then I were to die, if that was the it, I never know I was right. I'll only ever know if I was wrong. Because I would then stand before God who would tell me, no, you missed your opportunity. You lived for yourself. You missed it. And when it comes to our lives, there are so many things we can live and do, but in the one life that we have, what do we have to lose if we live it for him? But on a different side, we have everything, everything to lose if we choose to live by our own standards for ourselves. This is an important question. If we're going to live holy, set apart lives, we better be clear on what scripture says. And we better have a hermeneutic for discerning or, or a, a, way, a way by which we can read God's word and discern right from wrong. Uh, in all of this, I want to encourage us today to take an assessment of our lives, to place our own lives on trial, and to make sure that we are living in, in, the, in the will of God. I hope and pray this is helpful to you. These questions, they've been a, a help to me. Uh, I just want to pass that along to you so that hopefully uh, you can use that as a tool by which you can grow and live for God and, and maybe even counsel with others and help them through the decisions they're making. Our lives are built for community. One of the first things God said about Adam is it's not fit for man to be alone. We are built for each other. So let's keep each other accountable. Let's keep each other living for him. And in all the ways we can, let's make sure we're living for the will of God. God bless you. Love you. Church, hope you have a wonderful week in the Lord.